You could easily see people losing their whole life savings whilst others are seeing this massive swing to the upside. All to do with them. Hey guys, what's up? JH Vlogs here, back with another video. And today I want to talk about something a bit more serious and a bit more course orientated. And that is my thoughts on real estate pricing and why I believe fundamentally they're currently being valued at incorrect values. Now, when I talk about real estate, I'm going to talk about lots of different assets, but broadly it's going to come down to housing, so residential, offices and retail. Again, I'll switch between those, but those are the three main things I'm sort of discussing within this bracket. Although there'll be clear and obvious overlaps where it talks about all forms of property as well as just these. And I'll be talking about why I think these assets are fundamentally priced wrong for the reasons that I'm going to discuss throughout the rest of the video. So if that's something you want to find out more about, then stick around and stay to the end of the video. Without further ado, let's jump into it. With the most destructive reason and probably the biggest reason that's being slept on, and that is the physical risk that is coming with climatic change. What I mean by this is it doesn't matter how good the building is, it doesn't matter how prime the location is, how good the tenants are, how carbon neutral it is. If that asset will soon be underwater as sea levels rise or constantly experiencing extreme weather events such as hurricanes, that will just completely wipe out the value of the property. And I think this isn't really being too hardly considered at the moment. Although for the first time we are starting to see properties that experience natural disasters not fully recover to their pre-disaster values that we used to see before, it's not really being that widely accounted for. And that's something we're going to have to look to include because it is going to have a big role on property values. Just think about it. If insurance companies are already losing $150 billion a year on average between 2002 and 2012 on paying out for natural disasters to buildings, if this continues, they're not going to continue to insure those buildings. If they don't continue to insure the buildings, it's very unlikely lenders are going to be willing to lend on it because of the added risk that brings. What then happens to those properties? They have no insurance, really hard to lend in, can only really be bought with cash, and there's a high chance that they could experience some form of natural disaster. What happens to them? Are we removing them from the stock? Are there going to be defences put in place? Can you defend against it? If it's drought, it's going to be harder, I'm going to guess. I'm not, a, again, natural disaster expert, but what, what do you do with that property? That is the sort of risk we haven't really factored in and priced in at the moment, and we're only just starting to touch on and do. One of the biggest reasons, again, I think why fundamentally some, a lot of assets are being priced wrongly, and there's going to be a correction for that. Something easy to see is the increasing regulation that's going to be coming into the industry, particularly around the environmental side. As well as dealing with the climatic changes when they occur, we're trying to minimise them as much as possible and environmental legislation is coming in and it's going to continue to increase. For instance, we've already seen a bid to go carbon efficient to going carbon neutral now, and it's gonna only continue to step up. What happens to the buildings that just aren't efficient? Are they worth retrofitting? Is retrofitting going to be enough? Like, what needs to happen to all these properties? The legislative changes that are coming in, what's, what are they going to result in? If you need to bring your property up to here and that's gonna cost you millions of pounds to do it, is that going to be worth it? How can you sell that stock? Like, what, What's the plan? I'm gonna jump the gun a bit here, and I'm not gonna talk about the reasons I'm worried. I'm gonna talk about what this whole knock-on impact could be. I'll get to the other reasons later. Again, jumping the gun, but the main issue is, what happens to these buildings? Say again, the ones I mentioned earlier that are unsurable. Do we just leave them and deduct them from our property stock? Do we spend the money upgrading them? Is, is it feasible to? If your building's only worth, I'm gonna pick very round numbers here, one million pounds, and it costs 10 million pounds to bring it up. Obviously you're not gonna spend that, but where do you draw the line? How much do you need to improve? It's like these like quotas we have to hit keep going up and up and up. Again, there's a bill in the UK at the moment, I'm trying to make this world specific, but there's a bill in the UK at the moment that requires net uplifts after every development occurs. How much more are we gonna keep stepping up? If you had the one million pound property and then you spent the 10 million pounds on it to bring it up and then more legislation comes out, then what? Are you gonna spend it again? Then do you write off the asset? What are you doing with the asset? Again, do you, do you just have to write off those assets? Do you just have to say like goodbye to them? What's the plan? Can we, can we put more defenses in? Can we prepare for climatic change? How do we build more resilient properties? All these things, are they being thought about? Or are people just buying in say areas that are prone to flooding or going to be prone to flooding? Again, it's just one example. In areas that are gonna see extreme weather changes. W what's the contingency plan? Is that being factored into price? Again, from my own thoughts and feelings, I'm not entirely sure it is. I don't know how many investors are taking it on board at the moment. Again, I'm not an investor. This is, again, not advice in any sort of way. This is not financial advice. This is not property advice. This is just, again, my own thoughts. I'm thinking, 
these fundamentals appear wrong. On the flip side, properties that are hitting all of these goals, that are carbon neutral, that are in safe, lo safe locations, locations resilient to climatic change, they don't appear to have the additional value factored in that they're going to be safe or relatively safe, or that they don't need the improvements. You're not, from what I've seen in the literature, that's not really being reflected in the prices. Why is that? Are we going to see a massive value increase for these properties over the next few years? As again, fundamentally they're undervalued. Again, don't forget this is a two-way thing. There's not just the properties that are overvalued and exposed, there's the safer properties that aren't being recognised as being safer properties. There is chance for these amazing properties that I mentioned that are going to see upside value to have even more upside come in. Say there's currently talk about introducing laws about banks having an average minimum energy standard that they lend to on their account and so that their average property in their whole portfolio that they lend to was of a certain quality and a, a certain carbon quality. Now that level is currently up here or is being muted to be up here. If current property levels are more likely to here, to get there anything above that is going to be extremely highly valued because they need to balance the book somewhere. They need these properties that are all the way up here to balance that up to there. So those properties at the top end are going to see huge growths in value. Again, I think, I'm not sure, I'm not an advisor, don't take my word for it, I'm not qualified, but you can see where I'm coming from, right? The worry is for all these properties down here is that you're going to see a liquidity dry up and then after that liquidity dry up is when there's going to come a crashing back down, which is, again, the big worry. You could easily see people losing their whole life savings whilst others are seeing this massive swing to the upside, all to do with, with where the property is located and what its carbon rating is. Going back to the fundamental reasons why I think we could see a crash like this, you could see, for instance, COVID has turned the market on its head. We're not living in the same world anymore. You've seen what's been dubbed the London exodus, where people have just left London. I believe the same's happening in San Francisco. And what about offices? Are we going to continue to work virtually? Or are we going back in the centre? These offices, again, Zone 1 of London, the offices, the residential, that were always a prime, prime, prime. Are they still prime? Do they still have value or are you better off living somewhere higher quality of life because you can work virtually? Going into the office one or two days a week, if at all. Is that being factored into prices currently of the London market or are we still seeing an increase because of the housing shortage? Or is this just a blip and are people going to come back again once everything opens up? Are we going to miss that working office lifestyle? Relating to the pandemic, what about the tax risks? There's a chance again that governments around the world are going to need to find more revenue sources to pay for all the capital and all the borrowing they've taken throughout the pandemic. Where's that money going to come from? There's again the chance that that comes from property, it's very easy to tax and to some extent it lines up wealth with the person who's paying the tax quite nicely which again makes it sounding for a good tax but it's very speculative and how can you price that in? Where's the fundamentals? Is it even going to occur? Do you account for that? I'm saying is this a fundamental we're currently missing? Talking about pandemic related issues, what about the inflation that we're hearing again, a lot coming out of the US about the inflation levels. Are interest rates going to have to rise to combat that? And if they do, what's that gonna do for all those real estate lending models that were built in with this low interest rate environment and yield in mind? Like, does the debt suddenly then become unpayable? How many people is it unpayable for? Are we gonna see another crash because of that? Is that being priced in? Is it going to be a temporary measure? Have we got modern monetary policy? Is that going to be a way to get around raising interest rates? How are we factoring that in? There's also the question of how new property innovations are valued. There's growing housing shortages in so many places. There's technology trying to work on how to decrease the build time and how to increase the sustainability and the carbon rating. But how long, first of all, until that technology becomes trusted? And how do you price it? If suddenly build cost is halved, and environmental benefit of this construction method is massively increased, are you then going to see the standing building stock devalued as it can't compare to what's going up? Or if it's retrofitting, how long until these technologies are trusted widely? For instance, cladding was something that was brought in to try and help with sustainability. And in the UK, we've seen what happened tragically with the Grenfell Tower incident. How long until we can trust these technologies and what impact when they are trusted will they have on the rest of the housing stock? I'm not an expert and I certainly I'm not in a position to give any form of advice and this should, none of this should be taken advice. This is just, again, what I'm thinking about and partly educational. I'm just trying to get to the bottom of this. I, there's so many things that are hard to factor into property and people don't have the answers at the moment and that's why I believe we're fundamentally getting it wrong. Some of the factors I've mentioned here will have absolutely no impact and they'll just be, again, got round a different way that I can't think of right now or isn't widely known about right now. 
But there's other factors that I haven't mentioned in this video, such as UK specific police hold reforms that are coming up. How is that going to impact how much tenants are willing to pay or how much landlords are pricing their assets at? As a result of, again, legislation that we don't know the outcome of yet, it's just likely that we're going to see huge value swings in the prices of property, where, again, fortunes are unmassed and fortunes are unfortunately lost. It's the role of valuers to reflect the market, not to set the prices. Could this make the situation even worse? What I mean by that is they don't reflect it retrospectively. So after everybody else has already paid the amounts that they've paid, they then report on that rather than speculatively setting the prices here, here, there or there. They're again on the reflection side. So it means by the time these value swings have already taken place, that's when it will start to be known. And by that point, again, you'll have already seen the decreases in some properties and the increase in the others. There is no real number I can put to the percentage increase. Oh, you're going to see 100 percent or you will for the properties that again end up underwater, they'll see a 100% decrease, but I can't tell you how much the increase will be, or what about the gray areas, the properties that are slightly affected, but not really, I can't put numbers to this, it's so speculative, and I doubt any model in the world can model what's gonna happen effectively. But is that just me being naive? Do I not know enough about the subject matter? Well, thank you very much for watching. If you wanna see more real estate and university-based content, please hit the subscribe button, and have a wonderful rest of your day.